when I know someone's going to bring an argument, I not only respond, but I turn it against them and then decimate their objection. Yeah. This is precise, This is actually the Jeet Kune Do, Christianized Jeet Kune Do for apologetics. Actually, the Jeet Kune Do, Christianized so Jeet Kune Do for apologetics. Christianized Jeet Kune Do for apologetics. <laughs> think that when Paul quotes Old Testament texts, he's assuming that his audience will either have read the context or go back to context to see what the context is? Sure. Do you think that Paul will get away with misquoting passages, taking them out of context and be successful? No. Okay. So if we look at the context of that statement, Romans 9, 13, it comes from Malachi 1, verses 1 to 3. If Paul means that God hated Esau altogether in the sense that God had not destined Esau for salvation, that is a gross misreading of the Old Testament. So it either means the Calvinists are Bible butchers, tools of the devil, or Paul doesn't know the Old Testament, so he's a false apostle. It's only two choices. Yeah. For example, let's look at the context. First read for me Romans 9, 11 to 13. Okay, so... Um... Okay, let's see. Romans 9, 11? Yep, Romans 9, okay. 11 and 13, because that's what they're quoting. Now, we're going to read the passages he cited. Yeah, okay. okay. So, uh, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Um, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now here, he quotes Genesis 25, 22 to 23, and Malachi 1, 3, right? Yeah. Neither of which are talking about the salvation of an individual. It's talking about God sovereignly choosing to work corporately through the nation of Israel to bring about his salvation to the ends of the earth. See, here's where the okay. Calvinist tries to deceive you. They'll mm -hmm. tell you it's not about individual salvation. No, it's talking about individuals through whom God works covenantally to bring about his salvation to the ends of the earth. Because the individuals stand in place of nations, just like Pharaoh does. Are you with me? Yeah. Pharaoh stands in the place of the Egyptians. So the individuals stand in the place of the nations that they represent. So what Paul is saying is, he worked through Israel covenantally to bring about the salvation of the world. Now he's going to work through the Gentiles to bring about the salvation of Israel, who has been partially cut off. And I'll prove it to you, but I want you to understand what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that in the Old Testament, God singled out the seed of Jacob to work through covenantally to bring about the salvation of the Gentiles. Now that Israel has been partially cut off, God is going to work through the Gentiles to bring Israel back to salvation. That's the point of Romans 9, 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. Did you get it? The context of Romans 9 is, why has God rejected the nation of Israel? That's how he starts the context, Romans 9, 1 to 5. Yeah. So what is Paul doing? He's explaining why God has rejected Israel. Not because God has predestined him for destruction, but because of Israel's rebellion, God has now chosen to work through the Gentiles to bring about his salvation throughout the world. Whereas in the Old Testament, he did that through Israel. Did you now catch what the context is? Yes. Okay, so I got to make sure you're getting it or I'm not going to be yeah. able to help you. Okay. Number one, the focus is how is it God has rejected Israel? Did God's promise Israel fail? No, it didn't. God is free to work through any nation to bring about his salvation throughout the world. Because why did God choose Israel in the first place? Why did he choose them? To isolate the nations and damn them to hell? Is that what his purpose was? It was maybe to show like the, the purpose of the law. That's all he chose them? So the hell with the nations? Why yeah. did God choose Israel just so he can single them out for salvation and not care about the world? Or was God's purpose in choosing Israel is through Israel, bless the nations to move them to want to worship the God of Israel? Yeah, sure. The latter. Oh, you got it right. So the yeah. purpose, didn't God say to Abraham, 
All the families of the earth will be blessed in you. And through your seed, I will bless the nations of the world. Yes. Whose seed did God choose to then be a blessing to all the families of the earth? Abraham's seed, right? Yeah. So the purpose of Israel was to be formed by God, to be used by God, to be a light moving the Gentiles to want to worship the God of Israel and abandon their gods and goddesses. Now, did yeah. Israel okay. succeed or fail? They failed. Thank you. That's the point of Paul. Israel, in being stiff-necked and rebellious and sinning against God and breaking the covenant, constantly shamed God, disgraced God, humiliated God in front of the nations. Because if you're a Jew and you're worshiping Baal, what are you telling that Gentile? Baal is better than Jehovah, right? Yeah. So why would he want to worship Jehovah? Wait, you're a Jew, right? Yeah. And you're worshiping Baal? Yeah. So then that means my God, Baal, is better than Jehovah. So why should I worship him? Do you see how they're embarrassing God? Yeah. So what does God do? He brings forth the God man, God in flesh, the true is right, Jesus, who now fulfills the mandate given to the nation. Where they failed, he succeeds. But now Jesus works through his church that's composed predominantly of Gentiles to move all other Gentiles and Israel to salvation. Huh. Do we got that now? Yeah. Because I'm going to prove it to you from the passages he quotes. Because okay. I'm going to now show you the context of the passages that Paul quotes, that Paul realizes his audience will read the context. And the last thing you can use Paul of is misquoting. So when you read the context, then you understand, oh, okay, I see what Paul is saying. That in the beginning, God had chosen to work through Jacob's seed, Israel, to bring about the salvation of the world. But now God has cut off Israel partially due to their stubborn unbelief. And so now has chosen to work through the Gentiles who believe in Christ to bring the world, including Israel, to salvation. Because that's how he concludes in Romans 11, right? Yeah. Okay, now let me prove it to you. Do you see what he quoted? Go back to Romans 9, 11, 13. I'm going to prove it to you from the context. This is why when you get rid of this perversion of Scripture, Calvinism, and let the Holy Spirit illuminate your eyes, to see through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. Now read. Read for me. Romans 9, 11, 13. So we can now go back to the context of the passage to see what Paul's point is. Romans 9, 11 to verse 13. Yes. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now let's go to the context. Go to Genesis 25, 20 through 23. And you know what? I'm going to prove to you. You want me to shock you? Sure. You want me to shock you? I'm going to show you that God loved Esau and his descendants and desired their salvation. Did you know that? Where do you find proof that God even loved the descendants of Esau, and fought for them and protected them like he did for the Israelites. Genesis 25, 22 to 23. Okay, Genesis 25, 22 to 23. And the children struggled together with her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in the Oh, world. so they represent nations. Ah. Oh. See, now the lights, what, what have I been telling you for the past 10 minutes? Yeah, What's just said the that the context is passages? that they represent nations. The, passage, the point of Romans 9 is how God deals through nations to bring about his purpose. Hmm. So did you see what Jacob and Esau represent? The very passage Paul is quoting. And don't you think his audience will know the context? Jacob and Esau represent two nations. Hmm. One will wow. be greater than the other because one nation I will choose to be my covenant people and I'll work through them, not wow. the other. Oh, so the light switch went on? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'll finish it. I've, I've, uh, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I thought it was kind of weird when you said it, uh, that because they kind of symbolize countries. But, but this you is are a clear. weird human being. You're weird, sir, but I still yeah. love <laughs> you. Right. Yeah. Okay. So verse uh, 23 again. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall, shall serve the younger. So what's the context? 
nations. Yeah. Jacob is a nation. Esau is a nation. But the nation from Jacob will be greater than the nation from Esau. And yeah. the Edomites will serve the Israelites. Hmm. See, your fault was you didn't do what Paul expected you to do. Go back and read the context. Why didn't you do that? Yeah, good question. Exactly. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I have no Calvinist, excuse. That's what Calvinists are banking people to do, not read context. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Now, let's go to the one on Malachi 1 3. Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated, right? It said Malachi what? Chapter 1, because he says, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated, right? Yeah. Okay, but let's read the context of that. Malachi 1, start at verse 1, read. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, Yet I have loved Jacob. And I have hated Esau and laid his mountains. And his heritage wastes. So what does Esau represent? Wow. Yeah. What does it represent? A nation. So it re refers to the nation and their habitation that I destroy the cities of Esau because of their hatred and persecution of the Israelites. Huh. So again, is it talking about the individual or the nations that came forth from the individuals? It's got to be the nations, yeah. Yeah. So what is he saying? I chose you, Israel, to be my covenant people, not the Edomites. I'm working mm -hmm. through you, not them. But did you know in the Bible, the word hate doesn't literally mean to hate someone. It means that you favor one more than the other. Do you know that? I didn't know that, no. Well, I'm going to prove it to you. Everything I'm going to do, I'm going to prove to you. But you got to be patient and work with me because this is an important topic that I got to discuss. Absolutely. Okay, let me, let me prove it to you. Yes, I'm going to show you from Scripture where God uses love and hate not to show that you love someone and literally hate the other. In the context of you favor someone more than the other, you prefer someone more than the other, you love someone more than the other, but you okay. still love that other, but not as much as this one, or you still favor him, but not as much as this one. Can I prove that to you? Absolutely. That would definitely explain the words of Jesus also with, with hating ah. your parents. And, ah! Yeah. That was an example. He who does not hate father and mother is not worthy of me, right? Yeah. That was in Luke 14, 26, 29. Yes. But the same Jesus explains what it means. He who does not hate father and mother. Whoever loves father and mother more than me. Hmm, yeah. In Matthew 10, 37, 39, Jesus says, read it for us. Matthew 10, 37, 39. I'll give you another example. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross, not his cross, and followeth after me, is not worthy of me. Okay, now contrast it with Luke. Go to Luke fourteen twenty six to twenty nine. Any man come to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, ye and yet his uh, own life also he cannot be my disciple. Okay, I'm confused. Jesus said, "Don't love them, don't love them more than me." But here he says, "Hate them." Does he literally yeah. want you to hate your parents? No. So what does it mean here? Hate your parents and your children, your spouses, and then you'll be worthy of my disciples. Whereas there he says, don't love them more than me, because if you do, you're not worthy to be my disciples. You see that he doesn't mean you literally hate them because God himself commands out of your father and mother. Yes. So you see that here hate means do not love someone or favor someone or prefer someone as much as another. Yeah. Right now, let me give you another example. Go to Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. You see, when you get rid of this wicked, filthy, satanic system called Tulip, everything makes sense and it's beautiful. And you see how beautiful God is. He's not this monster that the Calvinists have made him out to be. May God save people from Calvinists and destroy the slides. If a man have two wives, one beloved, and another hate, hate him. Now, he, now, you caught it, right? He has two wives. Yeah. He loves one, hates the other. Does he literally yes. hate the other? So here it says, if a man has two wives, one beloved and the other hated, does he literally hate his other wife? No. Because if he hated her, he'd get rid of her and divorce her, right? Yes. So if he hates her literally and doesn't desire her, why not divorce her? Because it doesn't mean he hates her. It means he prefers one wife more than the other. Hmm. You caught it? Yes. You sure you're catching it? Yes, but... Um... Why, why are they translating it with hate? 
Because the Hebrew word is hate, but they assume that someone smart will understand it's not literally hate. Okay, yeah. Well, then why did Jesus use the word hate? That means you got to hate your father and mother literally. Yeah, good point. And that's the kind of question you're asking me, sir. Let me know yeah. when I should retire from ministry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want me to retire, huh? No, I'm just kidding. Well, no, 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 of course not. Of course not. All right. So you understand the problem is not with the term. It's with your understanding of how yes. these expressions are employed by a specific culture. Yes. Jesus was not speaking Greek in Luke 14. He would have been speaking Aramaic, but they tr yeah. accurately translate his words in Greek by inspiration. Yes. Malachi 1.3 is not written in Greek. It's written in Hebrew, but Paul accurately translates it in Greek. And so the word is hate in Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek. But obviously from the context you can discern, it's not literally hating someone where you have no feeling or love for that person. That's not how it's being used, right? Yes. Correct. You sure? Because in one place he says, do not love father and mother more than me. Other place he says, you have to hate them. Yeah. Obviously, he's not saying hate them, meaning your love for me should be such that your love for your parents <clears throat> will resemble as if you hate them. In other words, yeah. your love should be so great that by comparison, your love to your parents will look more like hate than actual love. Because in comparison to the way you love me, your love for them will look like nothing. Yes. That's the point. So here again, in Deuteronomy 21, 15, a man has two wives. One beloved, one he loves, the one other he hates. Now, the point yes. here is to protect the wife he, quote, unquote, hates. Because he says, if the wife that you hate gives birth to your firstborn, then you are to honor that son as your firstborn, even though he was born from the one you hate. You are not to give the status of firstborn from the son born <clears throat> from the wife you love, right? Yes, that's exactly what it says. So you understand he's saying, hey, you, you got two wives. One you love more, the other you love less. And by comparison, it looks like you hate her. But if that one that you hate gives birth to your firstborn, you better recognize him as his firstborn. You better not discriminate just because the one you love more gives birth to a son. I don't care if you love her more and love her less. He's your firstborn. Honor him as such. And the analogy is Jacob with Rachel and Leah. Jacob wanted Rachel, not Leah, right? Yes. But what did Laban give him? He stuck him with Leah. And then he had to work another seven years for Rachel. And who gave birth to his firstborn? Was it Rachel, the one he loved? Or Leah, the one he quote unquote hated. Leah. Why do you think God did not open up the womb of Rachel at first, but waited till the end? Because Rachel gave birth to his last two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, but opened the womb of Leah first so that Jacob would be attached to Leah because God saw he didn't love her as much as Rachel. So to correct that problem. Hmm. Are you getting it now? Yep. Okay, so do you understand Jacob I loved, Esau I hated doesn't mean I literally hate Esau, and it's talking about the nations. When yes. God preferred Jacob over Esau, he showed his preference by oh. choosing Jacob's descendants to work through covenantally, not Esau's descendants. Yes. Wow. Now, do you want me to now prove to you that God does love Esau and his descendants? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Go I to Deuteronomy I 2, verses 4 to 8. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 to 8. Verse 48. Now, before you read, God is telling the Israelites, speaking through Moses to the Israelites, and he warns them. Yeah. What he says. Okay, so verse 4. Uh, I command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them. For I will not give you uh, of their of their land. Wait, did you no see what land. God says? You Israelites, do not mess with the sons of Esau. I will yeah. not give you any part of their land. Don't mess yes. with them. Keep reading. Yeah. Not so much as a foot breath. Uh, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Who gave Mount Seir to the sons of Esau as inheritance? God. Who's warning Israelites, don't attack the sons of Esau because I will not allow you to beat them and conquer them and dispossess them because I gave them the land, it's theirs, and don't mess with them? Yeah, God. 
So why is God showing love to the sons of Esau? I thought he hated Esau. Yeah, he can hate Esau. But here it says, the sons of Esau, I gave them the land as their inheritance. I'm yes. the one who enabled them to conquer the inhabitants and take over the land out of my love for Esau. And you, my people, don't attack them. Don't dispossess, dispossess them. Don't mess with them because I won't help you defeat them. Does that sound like he literally hated Esau and his sons? No. Okay. Now finish at eight. When you're done with eight, I'm going to show you another section from the same chapter. Okay. So, uh, ye shall buy meat of them for money that ye may eat, and ye shall also buy, buy water for the, of them for money that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God has blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And when we passed by from our brethren that should the children of Esau, which dwelt in Zer, through the way of the plain from Elath and from uh, Ezeongeber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. So we didn't touch them. Yeah. We didn't harm them. We didn't attack them, right? Yeah. Now let me blow you away even further. Same chapter, Deuteronomy, same chapter, that chapter 2. Yeah. Right, you're reading four to eight. You're reading Deuteronomy two four to eight. Now, same chapter, Deuteronomy two sixteen to twenty three. Now, pay careful attention. Now, before you read it, Deuteronomy two sixteen to twenty three. Let me ask you a question: When yeah. God empowered the Israelites to destroy the giants in the land of Canaan and allowed them to conquer it, wasn't that a sign that God loved the Israelites? Yes. When He fought for them to conquer the Anakim, the giants, and take over the land, that was a sign of God's love for them, right? Yeah. Okay, now watch here then. Deuteronomy 2, 16 to 23. Okay. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. Did you catch it? The yes. Ammonites are the descendants of Lot. He goes, when you pass by the land, do not distress them. Do not meddle with them. Do not fight them, right? Yes. Keep reading. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. Huh. Keep on. Don't stop. That also right. was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. And the uh, Ammonites called them... Some Zemzumim, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, a, pe a people great of many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. Now catch what God did. Just like God destroyed the giants of Canaan, the Anakim, before Israel, yeah. showing his love for Israel and conquering their enemies, God destroyed the Zamzumim, giants in the land of the Ammonites, and empowered the Ammonites to conquer them, showing his love for them and enabling them to inherit the land. You see, in other words, what God did for the Israelites, he did for the Ammonites. Yeah. Oh, but wait, look what he does for the Edomites, the sons of Esau. Keep reading. Yeah. Uh, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horans before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. What did God do for the sons of Esau? Yeah, he also just destroyed... Um, the Horites, right? Like yeah. The Horites. So God empowered the sons of Esau to destroy yes. giants in the land of Seir, to yeah. conquer the giants, to possess the land. So God fought for the sons of Esau? Yes. And gave them a land? Yes. Just like he did for the Israelites? Yeah. Just like he did for the Ammonites? Yeah. Keep reading to 23, finish it. Okay. And the Adams dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Azah. Uh, the Kaftarins, which came forth out of Kaftor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. I'm confused. God loved and fought for the sons of Esau, the sons of Lot, the Ammonites, as well as these other Gentiles, right? The Avins, yeah. the Kaftorims, all of these people. He fought for them, empowered them to destroy giants in lands, that the giants lived in so that these people, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Avims would possess 
And the same way he fought for Israel and enabled them to conquer giants in Canaan? Yeah. So you're telling me that God showed love to the sons of Esau in the same way he showed love to the sons of Jacob? Yeah. So then I thought God hated Esau. So why is God blessing Esau and his descendants? And why is God fighting for the sons of Esau, empowering them to conquer giants mightier than them, to dispossess them, to inherit the land of Seir, in the same way he did for the Israelites? He has to have loved them. But the Calvinist tells me <laughs> God hates Esau and rejected him for salvation. Is that the reading now? No, they, they're, they're messing up the context for sure. The context is God working covenantally through a people to bring about his salvation. So if you guys want to know what Romans 9 is, Romans 9 is talking about why God rejected Israel in part and now is working through the Gentiles to bring about a salvation. Because God is sovereign and free so that in the beginning he chose to work through Israel. But what was the purpose of working through Israel? Using that nation to be the light of God, to move the nations to jealousy and worship God. But Israel kept dropping the ball, kept sinning, breaking covenant, and then rejected Jesus. Now God is fed up with them, so he's partially cut them off. So now God is going to work through the Gentiles, or part of the church, and through the Gentiles, he's going to move all the nations and Israel herself to jealousy to turn to Christ and be saved. It's talking about God's freedom to work through any group that he chooses to bring about the salvation of the entire world, not just the elect. That's the meaning of Romans 9. Thank you for that, Sam. For more clips like this, go to like and subscribe to the channel. Hit notification bell to get updates on any new videos coming out. Go on over to Sam's channel. Support there. Subscribe there. Um, full video link is in the description box below go check that out comment over there and the merch store going over to the merch store cop some gear to support sam's channel and ministry and my name is jay as always all praise to the one true triune god amen